So let's now move on to our next guest this morning. Uh, and uh, it's Jim Moss. And I first met Jim several years ago when he was suffering a career-ending illness. And his father actually had uh, run a benefit for him uh, in uh, Port Elgin. And I met Jim at that time for the first time. Uh, but three years later, he founded the Spile Epidemic, uh, an online gr uh, gratitude project. And then he launched Plasticity Labs, a research technology platform that develops psychological skills that drive happiness. His research findings have been published in the Harvard Business Review, and they produced a book, Unlocking Happiness at Work. Jim is now moving on to a new venture, and he has an amazing story to tell as how he has truly experienced how resilience through adversity creates opportunities. So let's now go live to Jim in Waterloo. Over to you, Jim. Good morning. Uh, it's been a great program so far. Can you hear me okay over there? Thumbs up. Excellent. Uh, yeah, I'm coming to you today from Waterloo, Ontario. Um, it's, been a, uh, it's been a really fantastic program. I have to say um, the, the themes that have emerged and the discussion topics that are kind of weaving them together to tell this story about taking risks and being open-minded and, uh, and mindful during periods of adversity. Um, those really could have, couldn't have been crafted better to set up the discussion that I would like to have with you today. Um, so I'm gonna talk about a few different things and um, it's gonna start with sharing my own personal story, which, uh, which obviously uh, seems a little bit like it was a setup, but that's that's how I start most of my talks. And it's funny because I kind of have gotten tired of telling it at times. Um, and I did feel like, you know, I don't really like to talk about myself to the same extent. But uh, oddly enough, this recent pandemic and the COVID-19, uh, this period of time, makes my personal story quite a bit more relevant again. Uh, then I'm going to tell us, uh, teach us a little bit about um, a little bit of science, and so some psychology around something called post-traumatic growth, um, and the science of resilience and empathy and um, and optimism, and why we need those things, why they're so important right now, and while it would be excellent to have developed those in advance, uh, when we have difficult periods of time like this, um, they actually present a really great opportunity if we can stay mindfully aware where we can develop those traits and learn to apply them in different ways. Uh, and then I'd like to open it up to some questions at the end as well and really move from how do we take this challenge that we're facing right now and leverage that into an opportunity um, in the future. So uh, I'm gonna go back and forth between a couple of slides here, um, but I wanted to, to tell you a little bit of my own personal story. Let me just share my screen real quick. There we go. So I, uh, I actually grew up in Brampton, Ontario, and the father, or sorry, the son of a Rotarian. I, I was raised in a Rotary family. My dad and my uncle, um, Ron Moss and Jerry Moss, are still very active in Rotary up in Huron Shores. But growing up in Brampton, I actually played um, hockey and lacrosse, which is a really typical kind of experience um, for, a, for a child in, in Ontario. Let me just see if I can share this. You see my screen there? Yeah, excellent. Just have to move so I can still see you over there. So um, I got to be very, very good at hockey and lacrosse. And I, my first job was in an arena. Um, I learned how to drive a Zamboni. I even had my first beer in the basement of Brampton Memorial Arena. And it had been chilling on the pipes that were used to cool the ice <laughs> in the basement. And so I, I grew up playing hockey and lacrosse and I had a really wonderful experience. I had great coaches. In sports, you are um, kind of raised by a village. So you end up with lots of different parents parenting you and, and you end up you know, having all these different coaches and mentors in your life. And I didn't realize it then, but my experience in sports was developing a set of character traits that were going to become very important to me later in life. Um, when I was young, I used to score some goals and get some assists. Uh, but as I grew older and the players got better, um, I moved towards the defensive end of the field or the rink. 
And uh, in hockey, I played for the London Knights. And, uh, and somebody once said that I had hands like a snake, uh, meaning that I didn't score too many goals. <laughs> and so I got to be quite good at the physical side of the play. And so my nickname became the Axe in lacrosse. And it's funny because my most recent title in my career is actually Chief Happiness Officer. And that couldn't be any more different than the Axe. So uh, in 2003, I was a young adult. I had just crossed into my professional hockey career and, um, and then had a few too many concussions. And so I had to take a year off. And when I returned, I decided that I would go back to playing professional lacrosse instead of returning to professional ice hockey. And so I had this really great opportunity when I returned back to playing in the National Lacrosse League. My team got purchased by the San Jose Sharks. And so they asked if we would be interested in moving our family out to California. And so I did that. My, uh, my girlfriend at the time became my wife, became my co-founder of the business, but also the co-founder of our three children. Uh, but we weren't married yet at that time. And, and so we ended up getting married so Jen could come out and join me in California. And we made a deal where we got our green cards and we set ourselves up with really quite a nice life. Uh, so I played professional lacrosse for about six years out there. And um, the one wonderful thing about a professional lacrosse career is that you get the opportunity to work as you go. So Monday to Friday, you have a job like everybody else. And then on the weekends, you get to go away and do the thing that you're so passionate about uh, and, and then still get paid to be a professional player. And I played in San Jose, I played in Albany, New York, and I played in Colorado. And in Colorado, we would get 19,000 fans. Um, so the place would just rock when we were playing. Uh, in, in my day job, I actually was also very fortunate to be able to work for one of the companies that made all of the equipment, STX Lacrosse. And so my job was to fly all over the Western United States and start these new lacrosse programs and help grow the sport of lacrosse in the Western United States. So um, an interesting turn of events that, uh, that we can't always foresee. In, uh, in 2009, if you recall, there was uh, another pandemic and that was the H1N1 virus. And so I was traveling one time for, um, for my work and I was traveling from California to Baltimore and I ended up in Baltimore staying in this Holiday Inn Express in the Inner Harbor um, of Baltimore there. And there's a commercial that's like, uh, talks about how great it was to stay at a Holiday Inn Express last night. Well, my experience was not like that. It turns out that on my flight to Baltimore, I caught the H1N1 virus. And, uh, and it was... It was a really, really difficult flu. Now it wasn't nearly, um, the, the illness that it created wasn't nearly as difficult as the one that we see today in COVID-19. And so it was really like, you know, the flu is kind of like a really difficult three days, four days, and you really want it to be over. I, I kind of think of it a little bit like a trip to Las Vegas. About three days of it is enough. By the fourth day, you're really, uh, you've really lost all of your pride at that point. And so the H1N1 virus lasted for about six weeks. And so I couldn't work for that period of time. And, um, and basically just had this really bad flu. So after that, I returned to, to my job. And so I decided for, for my first trip again, after H1N1 virus, I would go and see my favorite customer. And his name was Fish Bartlett. And he worked out of uh, Salt Lake City, Utah. And Fish was just this incredible guy. And he said to me, you know, you've had a really difficult few weeks. So instead of, instead of us sitting in the boardroom and meeting, uh, I've decided to take us fishing, um, fly fishing. And so we went fly fishing and um, had a wonderful day. You know, I went home. And it turns out I found out a few months later that on that day of fly fishing, I contracted the West Nile virus. So I had the swine flu, the H1N1, and now I had contracted this West Nile virus. And I didn't know it at the time. Uh, I just got sick again. And so everybody kind of assumed that I had just returned to work too quickly. 
Um, and so for the course of the next month, you know, I continued to be ill. And um, my wife, Jennifer, was pregnant at the time with our, with our second child. And then at the end of that uh, summer, we decided to move into a new, uh, into a new condominium. And, uh, and we had gone through this process of moving and Jen was very pregnant. Um, so I did most of the heavy lifting. And when, the, when it was all done on this Saturday morning, um, I was just kind of resting on the couch and Jen had gone out for the day. And uh, I got up from the couch to go to the bathroom like I had you know, thousands of times before in my life. And these are the little things in our life that we don't even think about. We just get up and do the things that we have done before so many times. Only this time when I got up to go to the bathroom, I kind of stumbled and I fell um, and I was losing the feeling in my, in my hands and my legs. And so if you've ever kind of had your, your leg fall asleep on you and you get that pins and needles feeling, that's what I had. And uh, so I kind of laid there on the floor in the living room realizing what was kind of happening to me and trying to kind of check in and, and consider what might be going wrong. And so um, I crawled the rest of the way to the bathroom on my hands and my knees and um, propped myself up on the toilet. Remember, this is in San Jose, California, so the very farthest other side of the world. And, uh, and when life is kind of hitting the fan, you know, who do you call? Well, Jen wasn't home and, and with her son Wyatt, she was out for the day. And so I called my mom all the way back in Port Elgin, Ontario. <laughs> so I called my mom and I told her what was going on. And she said, what are you calling me for, dipshit? <laughs> And if you know my mom, you know that that's exactly what I should have expected her to say. And she said, uh, you call 911 and then call me back right away. So I ended up calling 911. The fire department had to come and they knocked down the door and they, uh, you know, they break in and they put me on this gurney and they take me off to the hospital. So very quickly, you know, the two days prior to this, I was actually training to go back to my next season. And to do that, um, you know, I was getting closer to the age of 30. And so I, I didn't spend as much time in the weight room to train, but I would go out and I would run the mountains. I would run up into the Santa Cruz mountains because I was training to play in Colorado in Denver, which is a mile high. So I needed to get myself up into that altitude. And so here we are two days before this, I was able to run up a mountain and now I couldn't walk across the living room floor and get myself to the bathroom. So uh, as we get to the hospital, remember this is the United States, so I'm about to interact with the American healthcare system in a very serious way for the first time. Uh, they take me into the hospital. Um, I remember that on the way in, they took my, they pickpocketed me and pulled out my wallet and they swiped my Amex. And uh, fortunately, it had enough room on it because it was my company expense card, <laughs> which I got a very interesting phone call from my CFO a few days later. Uh, but because it got approved, they let me in to what was probably the best hospital in the region. And San Jose, California is really close to Stanford uh, University. And so um, here's this really big, healthy guy who, is, who they knew had had the H1N1 virus. And now a few months later has this, um, this challenge where I'm losing the feeling in my hands and my feet. And so all of these doctors start to come and poke and prod at me. By the end of the first night, um, the, the shift changed and they still didn't know, they, they didn't know exactly what I had had. They had run a ton of tests, but um, this doctor came on the shift around midnight and she said, you know, I think I know what you have and um, it's pretty early. It's too early for us to be able to actually tell with testing, but it's called Guillain-Barre syndrome. And in Guillain-Barre syndrome, it's a post-viral autoimmune disease where your immune system starts to attack your peripheral nervous system. So not your brain and your spinal cord, but all of the nerves that kind of go from your spinal cord out. So they, the nerves that you know, bring the, the information back and forth from your brain to your limbs and taking your kind of your sensation of the world and giving it back to your brain. 
And so she said, um, we don't know for certain, but there are some pretty advanced aggressive treatments that we can offer you. And uh, if we can stop the progress, you know, you might be able to heal from this much faster. And there's, you know, if you look it up on Wikipedia or, or on um, uh, any of the kind of online portals out there, by the way, don't do that if you're sick, because it almost always leads with, you know, 7% of people who die from this. <laughs> uh, and sure enough, so like anywhere from 15 to 25% of people can die from this, uh, this Guillain-Barre syndrome. But um, even kind of worse than that is at its worst case, it shuts down everything, all of your um, organs, uh, you're of a perfectly sound mind and you just lay in bed waiting for your body to heal. And so time is of the essence. The faster that they can stop the progress, uh, the less healing that you're required to do. And so I said, yeah, let's do the experimental uh, treatment. And so um, they, you know, they moved me from the emergency into the hospital. And the very next morning, uh, we open up the curtains. And sure enough, right out the window is the mountain that I had been able to run two days before that, the Santa Cruz mountain track. And so um, I started to realize that I was about to climb a new mountain. Um, and so the, the way that the disease progressed is that each day as your immune system is attacking your nervous system, they, they would draw with a Sharpie a line where your sensation was being lost. And so you literally had this visual progression of this disease and it's coming towards <laughs> the more important parts of your body. Um, we were pregnant with our second, sorry, let me change that. Jennifer was pregnant. I've learned through the, the years to that you are never pregnant as a husband. You are married to a woman who is pregnant and <laughs> supporting her. So Jennifer was pregnant with our second we lived in one of the most expensive zip codes in all of North America. Um, I was losing my income because of this and the disability uh, system in the United States isn't super strong. So the, um, the shit was hitting the fan in life. Um, and this is when I started to realize that the training that I was given in sports, the character traits that I uh, had developed in this kind of safe, playful environment of sports, uh, this is when they were really gonna pay off. So on the, um, on the third or fourth day, uh, I had these two nurses come in. Um, one nurse came in in the morning and we would walk across the, the hospital room um, and it took about 10 minutes with a walker and she would be there to support me because um, I had to go to the bathroom. And so, um, I didn't realize there's, there's a lot of bathroom stories in this story, <laughs> but I guess it is something that we do a lot every day if we're healthy. Um, so this morning nurse on our walk from my bed, so I've got the window seat in a, a semi-private hospital uh, room, and this nurse is helping me get to the bathroom. It takes about 10 minutes. We stop in the middle. She pulls out a stool and I have a rest. And um, when we're having our rest there, she said to me, you had better get used to this because you're gonna be like this for a long time. Um, so I like to joke that she has now, uh, she has this inspirational speaking career. <laughs> um, it was absolutely the least motivating or inspirational sentiment that you could say to somebody. Um, and that, it, it went against my nature. But uh, when, you, when you're in a situation where you're unfamiliar with what's happening to you, you look towards people who should know, and you place a lot of faith in their expertise and their experience. And so I went back to the bed, and I did exactly what she said. I started to really think about getting used to this, that this was my new normal, and I had to accept what had been given to me as being my normal. Um, and that was probably the worst day that I had in the hospital. But as luck would have it, um, I had to go pee again after dinner. And so I buzzed the buzzer, and this time a, a different nurse came in. 
um, a very, very different nurse. And we went on that exact same walk from my bed, you know, towards the bathroom, stop on a stool for a minute to take a break. Only this time when I stopped on the stool, uh, this nurse gave me a little squeeze on the shoulders. And there it is. I get goosebumps every time I tell this story. Um, and she said to me, don't you worry, sweetheart. We're going to get you back on your feet in no time. And that is probably one of the most impactful sentences that anybody has ever said to me in my whole life. It was exactly the opposite of the sentiment that the nurse had shared with me. So instead of having to give up and just wait this thing out, she was saying to me, no, 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 we've got this. Don't worry. And she said, we. So it wasn't just going to be them. It was me too. I was going to have a part to play in this. And so at this point, um, I started to really change my mentality. And I actually started to record things that I was grateful for. And um, th that's like a whole other talk that I do is the power of gratitude. And there's all this research that was done on the, um, the ability to change your actual mindset uh, by recording the things that you're grateful for every day. And so that's what I started to do. I started this gratitude journal and I started to share with people um, that I was grateful for them. And it helped me to stay in a really positive frame of mind through what was one of the most difficult things that I probably, well, certainly the most difficult thing I had ever endured up to that point in my life. And so it doesn't mean that I didn't have bad days. And it doesn't mean that, um, you know, that it wasn't still really hard and that the realities of it weren't super challenging. What it means is that I was able to take those bad days and understand them for what they were, but not let them be bigger than they needed to be. And so bad days didn't become bad weeks. And, you know, falling in the hallway while I'm relearning to walk didn't ruin my day. I just got back up again and kept going and even laughed about it. Actually have a little video here I'm going to show you. So, so if you can remember, two days before this, I ran up a mountain. In like under an hour, I ran a mountain. And now, let's see here. I have to relearn to walk from scratch. So I apologize because the, uh, the resolution isn't super good, but it'll give you an idea of what I was dealing with. He's walking so much better. Yeah. <laughs> so I do cane one, two. Cane, left foot, right foot. Cane, left foot, right foot. All right, that's it. That's the end of our talent show for today. We'll update you again soon. Bye. And hi, Brian Kirby. Sorry we're not at the second wedding either. So it's a little bit difficult even to watch for me a little bit now, but um, it slowed me down a lot. Um, but I think you, you probably could hear me giggle a little bit in there. And the when, when the nurse thought I was um, stable enough, she would pinch my butt. That's what the giggles were at the beginning. <laughs> and that's what kind of got me moving. Um, but so I, I would like that measurement there was the equivalent of about 10 hallway tiles. And it took me 14 days to get back able to do that on my own like that. And so from moving, from running up a mountain, being known as the ax to that, is a massive change in your life and it happens all at once. 
And, and so what I didn't really know then, I hadn't done the research yet, is that I was uh, demonstrating something called post-traumatic growth. And so, you know, by, by learning to be resilient and by keeping a positive mindset, um, I was able to, instead of following the instructions of the morning nurse, I was following the instructions of the evening nurse. And so I was finding a way to grow during a period of adversity. And so that is called post-traumatic growth. And very many people experience it. In fact, it's very common that people who lose a limb or a leg or lose the ability to walk from, a, from an accident, that a year later, they would not go back and reverse the event in their life that took away part of their, their functionality because they've learned so much about themselves uh, during the process. And so the hallmark of post-traumatic growth, which is like the ultimate form of resilience, is that you wouldn't go back and change the challenging events in your life because you grew so much from them. And so if you had to trade the growth to get back what you had lost, you wouldn't do it. Whereas people who are experiencing post-traumatic stress disorder often still feel like, um, they still feel like they are experiencing the stress, the stressful event. I'm just gonna pop something else back up here on the screen, let's see. So this post-traumatic growth is on a spectrum with post-traumatic stress, where post-traumatic stress, a year later, people commonly still feel like the event is happening to them, and they would do anything to go back and erase the event that created this post-traumatic stress, whereas people who experience post-traumatic growth are the opposite. And so... Um, after about six weeks, I got out of the hospital. Um, four weeks later, we ended up, uh, sorry, Jennifer ended up having um, our second baby. Her name is Olivia. So our first two children are American. We had a bonus baby uh, a few years later who is a, who's Canadian. But um, post-traumatic growth, I became very interested in this. And so I wanted to return back to university and study this. I couldn't go back to my job. I couldn't, um, I could never go back to being a professional athlete again. And if you had have asked me weeks before, you know, Jim, were you thinking about retiring? No way. I would have continued to play until I was 40 years old. I had no idea. I would, I would never have chosen the future that this um, very traumatic event in my life created for me. And so post-traumatic growth, what is it about, some people that when they experience the same type of traumatic event in life, they grow because of it. While other people uh, would do anything to avoid that event in their life. And that's what I wanted to learn about. And so what I found when I went back to university was um, I started to study uh, behavioral psychology, um, human and social psychology, and something called positive psychology. So traditional psychology is focused on how do we take people who are mentally unwell and get them back to average health? And positive psychology was about how do we work with people who are average in terms of their mental health and help them to flourish? So help them develop the traits that you need to flourish in life. And a subset of those traits um, in the research that I did at university and in much of the research that was done around the world, there was these uh, this constellation of traits that we now refer to as the hero traits. And so they are hope, self-efficacy, resilience, optimism, gratitude, empathy, and mindfulness. You'll actually, you'll see them on the poster in the back here. We developed a program called the Hero Generation where we actually start training those traits to children in their school environment as early as um, junior kindergarten. And, and they can learn it. And it is unbelievable when you see a six-year-old come up to you and say, hey, 
you just used mindfulness or that was really excellent empathy or what's even more powerful is when they come up and they say, Hey, Mr. Moss, that wasn't very mindful. <laughs> and they have actually noticed and they're policing and supporting you. And so you, you know, you eat a little bit of humble pie and you get down real low and you look them in the eye and you say, how could I have done that better? And then they work with you and you, and you're able to learn together about how to use these traits in your life. So as an athlete, we are developing these traits all the time. In fact, I think it's, it's places, because it hasn't been a core part of our education system historically, we learned this through our church communities or through uh, Cub Scouts and Girl Guides or through our sports. Now, it wasn't on purpose necessarily, but it was the lessons that we were taught along the way that we, didn't, we were never told this is a lesson about resilience or this is a lesson about optimism, but that was what they were actually teaching us. You know, now, because we didn't put accurate labels on it, when somebody said in the future, you need to be more optimistic, we didn't exactly know what that meant, even though we had built or developed some of that skill. And so when I got very sick, I quickly learned that I had developed all of these character traits, the ability to bounce back, the ability to learn on the fly, uh, to not repeat my mistakes, um, to maintain an optimistic or a hopeful mindset, to know that we can solve problems or figure out how to beat this team in the playoffs, even though we haven't done it for three games in a row. That's hope. Hope is figuring out how to solve a problem, even if you can't see the solution yet. And so all of my experience in sports, I developed these traits that I was really going to need. And, and it helped me to put them into use in my adult life. And so I've decided since then that I dedicate my life essentially to developing these traits in other people so that they have them before they need them before their challenging event in life. Um, we have to take the responsibility to develop these traits proactively. Um, we need to teach people about empathy. We need to teach people about resilience. And so you can imagine when COVID-19 hit, um, and for the last seven years of my life, I've been banging my head against the wall, trying to get leaders to buy in to this. Um, and then all of a sudden COVID-19 hits and, um, and we need them more than we've ever needed them. Only everybody needs them. And uh, it turns out that we had to close our company down in the first couple of weeks of the pandemic um, because the financial outlook and the opportunity just wasn't going to be there. And so now we're looking at a way to transition the hero generation into a not-for-profit um, and actually get it out to every school that we possibly can across the entire country. Um, so let me go back here. I want to zoom in on a couple of these traits specifically. Let's go. Where do we want to go here? Let's have a look here at resilience. So what, what does resilience actually mean? What we found when we uh, started to dig into these traits is that they're very simple concepts um, and we are using them all the time. But when I ask people, you know, well, what is hope or what is resilience? It's very difficult sometimes for people to actually say it in a simple way. But one of the wonderful things about working with children is that they tend to just say it in their own words and they simplify it down to its most simple form. And so what is resilience? Well, according to science, it, it's an adaptive way to deal with stress, positive and negative stress, um, to overcome adversity uh, and challenges in life. Well, when you ask kids, they say, oh, well, when you fall down, you get back up again. And that's exactly what it is. When you fall down, you don't stay down. You get back up again. When our country gets knocked down by COVID-19, we don't stay down. 
we get back up again. And when we're going on our way, you know, there was a story earlier this morning about um, the Special Olympics where a runner fell down. If we can't get up, we look to the people around us to come and get us back up, to dust us back off. And so that is national resilience. Uh, and that's what we're talking about. Um, now, there has been one slight improvement here where, you know, what's common when we talk about resilience, we say we bounce back. But there's a really great discussion going on in the world right now where would the right thing to do be to just default back to how we were? And so the concept of bouncing back means to go back to the way that we were when really what we want to do is bounce forward. We want to craft a new normal, not just return to the old normal. And changing under normal conditions is really, really, really hard because of this construct of neuroplasticity. The way that our brain works, the longer we've been doing something a certain way, the harder it is to change. And so you generally need these massive catastrophic events or major change agents to be able to push us into a period of change. Well, that's what we've got right now, this incredible period of change. And so there's an opportunity to change that we're experiencing currently that we don't have under normal times. And it's been happening long enough that many of our old ways of thinking and being have started to disintegrate. Some of our old bad patterns have started to fall apart. And you probably have noticed through the course of this pandemic that new habits have started. And if we're not choosing them on purpose, some of those habits aren't healthy ones. And so you may have caught yourself, you know, starting to develop some bad habits and had to like straighten up, take a deep breath, and push yourself out to start walking every morning because you weren't getting pushed out the door anymore. And so we've got an opportunity to craft our new normal. And so in the construct of resiliency in psychology, we don't want to bounce back. We want to bounce forward. There's a couple of other traits. I'm going to pop these up on the screen for you real quick, uh, just so that you've got them as well. If you recall, the, the hero gem traits, so this is part of uh, the research. These are the traits that we're trying to identify and develop. Hope, efficacy, resilience, optimism, gratitude, empathy, and mindfulness. Let's just take a couple, a quick look at a couple of these other ones. This is a slide that my wife uses all the time. <laughs> um, so optimism is about having a generally positive outlook on life. And the amount of optimism that this monkey is demonstrating. <laughs> uh, sometimes we need to take a leap, right? Sometimes we need to, even if the odds look like they're not very good against us, sometimes we need to jump out of the plane and build the parachute on the way down. And so optimism and hope are commonly kind of bundled together. We're not exactly sure, most of us, what is different between optimism and hope. We kind of think that they're the same construct. And optimism, optimism is about having a generally positive mindset. So when we're thinking about the, forward, or about the future, thinking forward, um, that we have a generally positive outlook on life. And so in our brain, the way optimism works, is that optimism focuses on the things that we have in our life. And so it's called a resource mindset. Um, so I'm aware of the resources that I have, and I'm constantly thinking about what I can do with those resources. Now, the opposite of optimism is pessimism. Now, hands up if you know somebody who's pessimistic. <laughs> um, they don't focus their attention on all the things they have in life they focus their attention on what's missing. And so while optimism is about what can I do with what I have, pessimism is about what can't we do because what is missing. And so what happens if we have a pessimistic mindset 
is at some point we just stop trying new things because we're so focused on what's missing from our life. And so we want to develop optimism because optimism focuses us on what we have. And if you remember, I briefly spoke about the gratitude journal. If you record in a journal every day what you're grateful for, at some point you can go back and read that. And effectively, it is a list of all the things that you have in your life. It's actually developing an optimistic mindset. And if we were to put you in an fMRI, we would see the optimism center in your brain starting to grow and actually starting to grow new wires into more parts of your brain because you're focused on all of the resources that you have in your life. So I want to pop up another one here. Another really important one is empathy. So as we think about resilience, and we go from thinking about it as individuals to thinking about it as communities or a business. Empathy is one of the most important constructs that we have. And there's been so much research done on it in the recent years. So empathy is about effectively thinking about or feeling how somebody else might be feeling or thinking at a certain time. So when you ask kids after we've taught them a bit about it, they'll say, it's about putting yourself in somebody else's shoes. So as we start to think about reopening our businesses, there's a great example of how to apply empathy. Maybe you're one of those people who hasn't been too um, overwhelmed by, uh, by COVID. And so, you know, you're a little bit less fearful maybe about contracting it. And so as you go to reopen your business, you know, you might tend to downplay some of those safety measures. But what about your customers who are hyper afraid and nervous about this, about contracting it? Or they've got somebody in their home who really, really couldn't um, handle COVID well if they were to contract it. Empathy allows us to imagine how many different people might be feeling and start to act with compassion, meaning changing the way that we behave based on empathy. And so if we empathize with different people, we're more likely to develop solutions and to behave in ways that is more generally positive or experienced in more positive ways by those other people. What's really important with empathy is that it is an imaginative experience. So, um, so sometimes you, you deal with a challenge in your life and somebody might say, oh, I know exactly how you're feeling. But they've never actually had it. I remember one time when we were, you know, we were becoming new parents and we had our first baby and somebody said, oh, I know exactly what you're going through. I've got a puppy. <laughs> well, no, no, you don't. <laughs> Um, your puppy hasn't pooped across the room and hit you in the chest, unless there's some kind of miracle puppy. Um, and so you almost become offended by that because they're failing to say that I can imagine some of the things that you might be feeling or noticing the difference between those things. And so they're mapping inaccurately their own experience on yours. And so it's important to know with empathy that it's never perfect, but it's designed to take us closer to how people might be feeling. And if we think, you know, that we've come along some distance, but it's still not close enough, then we need to ask. We need to ask somebody who's actually going through that experience how they're feeling so that we can tune our empathy up a little bit better and then we can solve problems for people in a more empathetic way. And so, you know, under the construct of resilience and post-traumatic growth, empathy is super, super important. When we're thinking about changing and crafting a different normal, a different future, we have to use empathy to imagine how people might be feeling so that we can solve problems in new ways. Now, there's another really important part of empathy here, and I want to give you an example of if we don't understand some of these things well enough, um, 
we can kind, they can kind of backfire on us. So you've heard of the golden rule before, right? And the golden rule tells us to do unto others as we would have done to us. So treat other people the way that we would like to be treated. Now, this might be a little bit contentious, but I want you to hear me out and imagine this. I'm a middle-aged white man. If I were to treat other people who aren't middle-aged white men, how likely is it that I'm gonna treat them the way they want to be treated? If I build the rules based on how I want to be treated, I'm going to leave a lot of people out. And so the golden rule, so versus not thinking about other people at all, the golden rule brought us along part of the way. But there's been an improvement from research to actually create something new called the golden golden rule. And the golden golden rule says, don't treat other people how you want to be treated. Treat other people how they want to be treated. And when I say that, I hope that many of you feel immediately how much more success we would have if we used the golden golden rule instead of the golden rule. And so the reason I bring that one up is that it just, it's such a powerful example about how by understanding uh, the science a little bit, the psychology, we can take something that's working okay and understand how to apply it and have immediately more successful results. So that morning nurse, right? Maybe it would be ideal in her life that, you know, she just accept her circumstances. And so that may have been, you know, seemingly the right thing for her at the time, but it wasn't the right thing for me. You know, it may have been that she wanted me to stop buzzing the buzzer and interrupting her, you know, and all the other important work that she had to do um, to help me go pee in the bathroom and she'd rather me pee in the cup that they provided me. But I needed to hear what the nurse on the night shift said to me. And so if we can use empathy and adjust the way that we interact with people in very tiny ways, we can unlock tremendously positive changes in the outcome, in the results. So we've only got a couple minutes left here. I wanna help keep everybody on track. Um, I think the, the program this morning, uh, you know, as much as we would all love to be together right now, having the conference that was planned two years ago, I really have to say that the program that's come together this morning is a really exceptional one for right now. You know, we heard in the, in the morning from Chris Cummins that we need to lean into adversity and be okay with feeling um, outside of our comfort zone and to see opportunity that might exist under, um, that didn't exist under normal times. And that's what we need to do right now. We need to rethink things right now and we need to find out how to be okay with where we are and start thinking about the future that we want and knowing that the science of neuroplasticity, the science of how our brain and our habits change is actually working in our favor right now because so many things are changing. We've got a better opportunity to change things right now than we have for the last decade, maybe even 25 or 30 years. Because there's so much change, there's an opportunity to lay down new neural pathways and new pathways in life in general. You know, when we heard about all the stories um, in, the, in the middle portion of, this, of the, the morning's program, you'll notice that each of those had some uncertainty. Some of them had a little bit, some of them had a lot. Um, you know, Chris 
overcame so much adversity to create something incredibly positive with his life. That's post-traumatic growth. We might not think of some of these things in our life as traumatic, but they absolutely are. And when we overcome them, we've already shown examples of post-traumatic growth, right? When we don't know what city we're going to end up at, and then we find out, or, or when we find out that the winters are as cold as they were, and people warned us about them, but they never warned us for how we might experience that cold walking to school on our exchange program, that's adversity. And so that's an opportunity to learn something that we couldn't have learned if we had have stayed in our safe space. So right now we're in a period of time that we haven't chosen to be here. We've been thrown in to this period of time. But we're all in it together. And so there's an opportunity, not just for an individual to grow, but for us to grow as an entire community. And so in the, in the context of Rotary, when you're thinking about your individual businesses, your individual communities, you know, the regions and the countries and the provinces and the states where you live, think about how can Rotary use your collective experience and skill set and resources to start crafting a new normal, a better normal. Let us not go back to how things were. Let's think backwards and pull some of those best parts of how things were and let them carry on. And then let's replace some of the things that were maybe built on the golden rule thinking with golden, golden rule thinking. And take some of these little tiny lessons and leverage them inside of the opportunity that we have to build the best possible future that we can, not just for ourselves, but for everybody that lives in our community. And if we're able to do even a little bit of that, I think we're gonna find that we look back in five years or 10 years, and we will find a way to feel grateful for the COVID-19 pandemic because so many positive things changed because of it. Thank you so much for having me this morning. Um, I noticed that there's one question here uh, that was the post-traumatic growth aligned with the work of Martin Seligman? It absolutely was. So Martin Seligman is the grandfather of positive psychology. He was the president of the American Psychological Association. And in, uh, in the late 1990s at their annual conference, he stood up and he said, we have to quit focusing all of our attention on people who are sick. And we need to su start supporting people who are healthy and help them to be even more healthy, um, which will reduce the number of sick people that we have to support and allow us more time and energy to really work on the people who are sick, but not leave out the people um, who want to be better than average. And so Martin Seligman, uh, we owe all of this research fundamentally to Martin Seligman, who, who launched this new way of thinking and the concept of positive psychology. If you've got any other uh, questions, please feel free to send them along. On Twitter and Instagram, I am the Smile CEO. Really easy to find. I'm super active on Twitter, and I'm happy to have all the conversations that we would have had in real life if we were there. Um, I've got my Rotary mug. It's filled with vodka. And I've got my Smile mug that's filled with coffee. So please feel free to reach out to me on Twitter and Instagram and, uh, and carry on this conversation. And thank you so much for your time and your, uh, your attention and for including me. Jim, thank you for your time and presentation. And mostly thank you for tying together both in your presentation and in your summary, what this whole morning has been about. Not to worry, I think we're going to have an optimistic like We've got a new direction for Rotary. It's just we don't know how to do it or what it is. But you and the other speakers have put us well on our way. And we look forward to your joint discussion uh, that's coming where the panelists get together and help Rotary decide, or think about at least, where do we want to go, how do we get there, and what will the new Rotary look like? And speaking of new and moving on moments, we're going to take a break for a, an interval and talk to the good folks from London 
who have the great fortune to be hosts of next year's district conference. I'll turn you over to David Elliott and London. We hope you have as much fun doing it as we have. What a great time to be a Rotarian. COVID-19 helped us show our communities what we can do in the time of need. But what about the future? Well, one thing we know for sure, the future will arrive. We can't tell you today what the District Conference 2021 will look like. We can't tell you for sure exactly where and how it will occur. But we do know when. June 4th and 5th, 2021. So hold those days in your calendar. We will get together. Some of us will be face to face or mass to mass. Some of us will be virtually. We'll celebrate Rotary's achievements. We'll compare notes on how we continue to serve and assist our home communities and in communities of fellow Rotarians around the world. We'll plan for the future. So while we don't know how or where, we'll convene. We do know when, June 4th, 5th, 2021. And in these uncertain times, isn't it great to know one thing for sure? So please sign up, watch the district website with more information to come. Thank you and have a great day. Well, there you have it. Next year's conference will be something, somewhere, but we do know it's June the 4th and 5th, so save the date. And do you like the shirt? It's my Hawaiian shirt. And uh, David Elliott and I would have been in Hawaii this week, but so this is the best or nearest thing we could come to it. So I'm hoping that David will be online to have a quick chat with. Hi there, David. I just love those glasses. We're not hearing you, David. He obviously can't see his mute microphone through the glasses. Yeah. Are you in a, a, a airplane cockpit or a helicopter or what? Here we go. Can you hear me now? I can hear you now, David. So, Perfect. let's draw this uh, blue sky through your uh, canopy there. So, what's the weather like in Port Franks? In Port Franks, we have uh, 15 degrees, feeling like 19, and feeling like it should warm up a whole lot more. Okay. So, tell me a little bit about what was on your mind when your uh, conference team for uh, 2021 started planning uh, for the thing, because I know you've been planning for over a year now. Yeah, just like you. And I, first off, I want to congratulate the Southampton Club for not only putting on a wonderful, excellent program this morning, but having the, the desire to change because we all know that uh, a lot of our Rotarian traditions uh, carry us through quite easily. But to do what you guys have done this morning is absolutely amazing. And uh, I just want to thank you on behalf of all Rotarians for what you have done. You've You've got a record number of people watching this morning. You've got some amazing speakers and uh, it's going to be difficult to follow because part of what we were going to do is we were going to have a very traditional uh, session next year, but we put everything on hold. Um, and what we wanted to do was exactly see what happens here. And from here, we're going to decide what we're going to do. So as I put in the video, we're not really sure what it's going to be, but you have uh, really, really moved um, the, the needle as to what we can and can't do. And again, I just want to congratulate uh, uh, the Southampton Club for a wonderful, wonderful morning. Um, and also for you and Sylvia, you have uh, both done a great job of leading us through the year. And, and I guess you probably feel like you've had two years this year because uh, you have uh, got restarted back in March again. And, and I have enjoyed the journey with you and, and wish you guys all the best. Thank you, David. For Thank that. You. I feel like the last of the road warrior governors and the first of the virtual governors. So uh, it's been yeah. a bit, but it's been a blast though. And we thoroughly enjoyed it. And it's certainly given me a focus for the last part of the year. Uh, I believe one of the things you were going to do though at your conference was celebrate 50 years of Rotary Youth Exchange. Tell me a little bit about that. Yeah, so the plan was, and still is the same plan. We, uh, Rotary is celebrating 50 years of, of Youth Exchange, as you mentioned. And our plan was to invite all uh, youth exchange students, whether inbounds or outbounds, their host parents, 
everybody to uh, our conference. That's still going to happen. Um, it's just how we do it is, is what's going to change. But uh, really looking forward to inviting everybody back. We had uh, approximately 250 people that had said they would come back for an in for that. So it's, it's going to be a, a pretty good celebration. But uh, we're, we now have different ways of, of doing it thanks to you. All right. So anyway, thank you very much, David, for joining us from Port Franks. And uh, we're now going to move on to our next guest uh, this morning, which is Valerie Wafer. And uh, to Rotarians, Valerie needs no introduction whatsoever. But I will give for everybody else a little bit of background. She is the incoming zone director for Rotary International. And, and in simple terms, that's the nearest thing I get to having a boss. Uh, Valerie is a former franchisee owner of six Tim Hortons restaurants in the GTA, and she's a strong advocate for people with disabilities. She has participated and led many Rotary uh, initiatives uh, around the world and certainly within her own district. Uh, but like many of us, she's almost a full-time Rotarian now. And today, Valerie is going to give us an update on how Rotary International is coming to terms with the future. Valerie is joining us from a studio near Collingwood, and over to you, Valerie. Thank you so much. Good morning, everyone. Uh, and again, congratulations on this innovative, and I might say very professional platform to hold your district conference. It's been amazing. Um, you know, we may not have envisioned being together like this, but I think it's wonderful that we were able to, uh, to pivot and to meet like we are. And as Jim said before me, we've had some amazing speakers today that have built on each other. And Jim spoke to us today in his words with his story, how resilience through adversity creates opportunity. And he gave me the perfect segue to some of my comments. And I guess that's one of the advantages of being the last speaker. So I thought I would take the time that I'm with you today to speak to you about who we are, the pace of change, and what will never change in Rotary, and how adversity, COVID-19, has created an opportunity for us. So what will never change is our core values. Fellowship, integrity, diversity, service, and leadership. Our core values were important to us in 1905 as they are today, and their importance will never change. Our history has given us the reputation and framework of our values and our four-way test. What does change is the st uh, strategies and tactics and the framework that allows us to pivot and be nimble during this pandemic. So our core values. Let's start with French, a fellowship. This is one of the pillars to our organizations and our clubs. It has been tough not being able to greet each other as we normally do because we're sociable people who love to hug. <laughs> And I think that uh, we were able to pivot to an online platform for this very reason, because we need each other, and Rotary and Rotaract needs us. I've seen some amazing support to our members that perhaps in the past would not have embraced technology or even understood technology. I was on a meeting last week where a man in his 90s was instructing a fellow member much younger than him how to log in to his weekly meeting. And two minutes later, there he was. This gentleman was very proud of himself and I couldn't help but think he learned himself to stay connected. We need to laugh, we need to meet, we need to support and we need to celebrate just like we are here today. And for grandparents who have never embraced technology or taken the time to learn it, it's their lifeline to their grandchildren. Change all of a sudden doesn't seem so difficult now in life and at our Rotary Clubs. We've had social events, dinners, birthdays, and next week Mike's calendar is filled with changeover celebrations for presidents and for district governors. And actually for directors as well. We're gonna be doing our virtual changeover from director Jeffrey Cataret to myself virtually. We celebrate our accomplishments and we need our fellow Rotarians by our side. And this will never change. In fact, we had a presentation at our last Rotary International Board meeting which was online in April, about how membership has been affected by worldwide events. And I didn't realize this, but we have a PhD statistician working at Rotary International. And he plotted our membership numbers from the time Rotary began against global events such as the Depression, World War II, the energy crisis, 
the financial crisis, including the 2008 recession. And guess what the finding was? During a worldwide crisis in the immediate years following, our membership decrease was very, a very small percentage. And I will suggest it's because the world needs Rotary and the camaraderie and the fellowship as support. This builds lasting relationships that carry us through times like this and creates a really strong bond. And when our part of the world opens up again, I know we're gonna celebrate and we're gonna celebrate our accomplishments. We're gonna celebrate our decisions. We're gonna celebrate our language and our actions during this time of physical distancing and COVID-19. And it's gonna be an amazing day. I just can't wait for that. So let's move on to integrity. Integrity is a personal quality of fairness that we all aspire to. And in Rotary, we've surrounded ourselves with honest people. We respect our fellow Rotarians and we stay focused to our commitments, like our promise to the children of the world that no child will be paralyzed by polio. And we will see the end of this dreaded disease. Integrity, our four-way test. You know, through this pandemic, especially in the early days, we woke up every day to disturbing facts and the fear of the unknown. And it's understood that we'll make mistakes. And this is true in almost every day of our lives, in our business, in our family, and in Rotary, we make decisions based on the facts we have today in the current environment. But we know as Rotarians, we have the guiding principle of our, of our truth statement, the four-way test. And we can only make the best decision in the moment knowing it is fair to all concerned. C.S. Lewis said, integrity is doing the right thing even when no one is looking. Well said. Our next core value is diversity. And we're all diverse in an obvious way in our organization as we rep we're represented in over 200 global countries. But are we inclusive? One of the statements I make quite often is diversity is the word, but inclusion is the action. Now we're not a political organization, but it is very difficult to turn a blind eye to the racism, to the many underrepresented demographics that we're seeing today. Where there's tragedy, there also comes opportunity for change. We are seeing movements. We are seeing the next generation seeking and demanding change in a peaceful and impactful way. I was very proud of Rotary International to release their statement on social media on racism. The statement recognized the issue. It stated that we can all do better and that we stand for peace and justice and we will listen and contribute in a positive way of change. And I think this is really true at the club and district level as well, because our diversity and equity statement isn't words we print out and put up on the wall. We must live it. And now service. There was a recent survey taken asking Rotarians what the top three reasons they're in Rotary and they answered local service, connect with others, and friendship and fellowship. When the same question was asked of potential members, their answers were local service, global service, and personal growth and learning. Interesting. So herein lies the opportunity for us during this pandemic because both current and potential Rotarians who responded to the survey chose local service as their number one driver to Rotary. And we already know this because many of our clubs have substituted a meeting for hands-on service projects. And more than ever, our local regional communities need us. We will see a loss of small and medium-sized businesses. And these are the businesses that drive our local economies. So we need to reach out to those who have always supported us in our fundraisers, as our donors, it's time for us to support them. This is what we do as Rotarians. Not to mention that many of those small and medium businesses, business owners are our fellow members. We must take care of our towns, cities and members. And we need to take a look, perhaps through a new lens, this, through what this pandemic has given us and ask ourselves and other key stakeholders, what will my town need today? What will my town look like tomorrow? And how can we help? Service, support, and respect will lead to membership in the future. 
and others will want to join us. You know, I quite often get asked about public image grants and if Rotary International will bring them back to help us identify ourselves in our communities. This is the time now to roll up our sleeves and get out when you can and how you can. Because public image begins at the grassroots with clubs focusing on the specific needs of their community. This is the best PR a club or district can receive. Recognition that in the times of crisis, we stepped up and made a difference. And finally, leadership. You know, we quite often speak of change in Rotary, and not always in a positive way, but more often the slow pace that frustrates many of us. So we have a silver lining in this pandemic, and that's not to take away from the loss, but where we are today would have taken us five years to get, given our past acceptance or non-acceptance of change. And look where we got in four months. We can't go back. We have pushed the go button. Let's embrace the things that we did well and look at Rotary through a new lens. We are ready. We've been preparing in incremental steps. The flexibility in our clubs as a result of the Council on Legislation in 2016. There's discussion and committee work at the RI board level to look at our overall governance structure, something that I don't think we've done in the history of our organization. We are focused on Grow Rotary. And we recognize that in North America, we will only grow Rotary through new innovative club models. I was on a call last week with our General Secretary, CEO, John Huco from Rotary International, and he used an expression that resonated with me. And he said, we were built for this. It was incredible to have that leadership and that conversation come from our CEO. And I believe, we are ready. You know, when I decided to put my name forward for nomination as a Rotary International Director, I did so because I believe in change. I saw that our organization was moving forward and I wanted to be part of it. Little did I realize the tsunami of change that we're facing, but we are poised. We are ready to make systematic, sustainable change to our organization. And I believe this crisis is silver lining is that where this change may have been controversial to some, maybe even radical, last year, today will be embraced and supported and continue in the coming years. So I truly believe we will be a stronger, more relevant organization on the other side of this pandemic and the world will look to Rotary to continue to do good in the world because we are people of action and we are ready. So thank you, and now I'll send it back to you in the studio. Thank you, Valerie. Thank you for joining us here. Thanks for sharing the message. And most important, thank you for volunteering to go ahead and be our representatives at Rotary International. You're going to be a great rep, and hopefully you've gleaned a few things here this morning that, that the District 6330 would like to see happen and led by Rotary International. But thirdly, thank you for agreeing to be part of our panel.